Pagan Perspectives presents the new series of Pagan Reads. This time around, we start with the Elven Nations Trilogy, Volume 1, Firstborn, by Paul B. Thompson and Tanya R. Carter. Prelude, Year of the Dolphin, 2308 P.C. The great river Thon Thalus flowed southward through the forest of Sylvanesti. Three quarters of the way down its length, the broad waterway branched and twin streams flowed around an island called Fallon. On this island was the capital city of the elven nation, Sylvanost. Sylvanost was a city of towers. Gleaming white, they soared skyward, some dwarfing even the massive oak trees on the mainland. Unlike the mainland, Fallon Island had few trees. Most had been removed to make way for the city. The island's naturally occurring marble and quartz formations have been spell-shaped by the Sylvanesti, transforming them into houses and towers. Approaching the island from the west on the King's Road, a traveler could see the marble city gleaming with pearly light through the trees. At night, the city absorbed the starlight and moonlight and radiated it softly back to the heavens. On this particular night, scudding clouds covered the sky and a chill rain fell. A brisk breeze swirled over the island. The streets of Sylvanost, however, were full. In spite of the damp cold, every elf in the city stood outside, shouting, clapping, and singing joyfully. Many carried candles, hooded against the rain, and the dancing lights added to the strange yet, strange yet festive air. A wonderful thing had happened that evening in the capital. Sithil, Speaker of the Stars, ruler of all Sylvanesti, had become a father. Indeed, the great fortune of Speaker Sithil was that he had two sons. He was the father of twins, an event rare among elves. The Sylvanesti began to call Sithil twice blessed, and they celebrated in the cool, damp night. The Speaker of the Stars was not receiving well-wishers, however. He was not even in the palace of Quinari, where his wife, Nerakina, still lay in her birthing bed with her new sons. Sithil had left his attendants and walked alone across the plaza between the palace and the Tower of the Stars, the ceremonial seat of the Speaker's power. The common folk were not allowed in the plaza by night, the Speaker could hear the echoes of their celebrations. He strode through the dark outlines of the garden surrounding the tower. Wending his way along the paths, he entered the structure through a door reserved for the royal family. Circling to the front of the great emerald throne, Sithil could see the vast audience hall. It was not completely dark. Six hundred feet above him was a shaft in the roof of the tower, open to the sky. Moonlight, broken by clouds, filtered down the shaft. The walls of the tower were pierced by spiraling rows of window slits and encrusted with precious jewels of every description. These split the moonlight into iridescent beams, and the beams blazed the walls and floor in a thousand myriad colors. Yet Sithil had no mind for this beauty now. Seating himself on the throne he had occupied for two centuries, he rested his hands on the emerald arms, allowing the coolness of the stones to penetrate and soothe his heavy heart. A figure appeared in the monumental doorway. Enter, said the speaker. He hardly spoke above a whisper, but the perfect acoustics of the hall carried the single word clearly to the visitor. The figure approached. He halted at the bottom of the steps leading up to the throne platform and set a small blazer, brazier on the marble floor. Finally the visitor bowed low and said, You summoned me, great speaker. His voice was light, with the lilt of the north country in it. Vedvedesca, servant of Gillian, Sithil said, Rise. Vedvedesca stood, unlike the clerics of Sylvanost who wore white robes and a sash in the color of their patron deity, Vedvedesca wore a belt and tabard of solid gray. His god had no temple in the city because the gods of neutrality were not officially tolerated by the priest who served the gods of good. Vedvedesca said, May I congratulate your highness on the birth of his sons? Sithil nodded curtly. It is, become of them, it is because of them that I have called you here, he replied. Does your god allow you to see the future? My master Gillian holds in his hands the Tobril, the Book of Truth. Sometimes he grants me glimpses of this book. From the priest's expression, it was appearing that this was not a practice he enjoyed. I will give you one hundred gold pieces, said the speaker. Ask your god and tell me the fate of my sons. That Vesica bowed again, he dipped a hand into the voluminous pockets of his tabard and brought out two dried leaves, still shiny green but stiff and brittle. Removing the conical cover from the brazier, he exposed hot coals and held the leaves by their stems over the dully glowing fire. Gillian, the book, Grey Voyager, Sage of Truth, Gate of Souls, 
by this fire opened my eyes and allowed me to read from the book of all truth. The cleric's voice was stronger now, resonating through the empty hall. Open Tobril, find for Speaker Sithel the fates of his two sons, born this day. Then Vesica laid the dried leaves on the coals. They caught fire immediately, flames curling around them with a loud crackle. Smoke snaked up from the brazier, thick, gray smoke that condensed as it rose. Sithel gripped the arms of his throne and watched the smoke coil and writhe. Then Vesica held up his hands as if to embrace it. Gradually the smoke formed into the wavering shape of an open scroll. The back of the scroll faced Sithel. The front was for Vedvesica only. The cleric's lips moved as he read from the book that contained all the knowledge of the gods. In less than half a minute the leaves were totally consumed. The fire flared three feet above the golden brazier, instantly dispelling the smoke. In the flash of flame the priest cried out in pain and reeled away. Sithel leaped up from his throne as Vedvesica collapsed in a heap. After descending the steps from the throne path platform, Sithel knelt beside the cleric and carefully turned him over. What did you see? he asked urgently. Tell me, I command you. Vedvesica took his hands from his face. His eyebrows were singed, his face blackened. Five words. I saw only five words, Highness, he said, falteringly. What were they? Sithel nearly shook the fellow in haste to know. The Tobrel said, they both shall wear crowns. Sithel frowned, his pale, arching brows nodding together. What does it mean? Two crowns, he demanded angrily. How can they both wear crowns? It means what it means, twice blessed. The speaker looked at the brazier, its coal still glowing. A few seconds glimpse into the great book had nearly cost Vedvesica his sight. What would the knowledge of Gillian's prophecy cost Sithel himself? What would it cost Sylvanesi? Chapter 1 Spring, Year of the Hawk, 2216 PC Clouds scattered before the wind, bright white in the brilliant sunshine. In the gaps of blue that showed between the clouds, a dark winged form darted and wheeled. Far larger than a bird, the creature climbed with powerful strokes of its broad wings. It reached a height above the lowest clouds and hovered there, wings beating fast and hard. The beast was a griffin, a creature part lion, part eagle. Its magnificent eagle's head and neck gave way to the torso and hind quarters of a lion. A plume's lion's tail whipped in the wind. Behind the beast's fiercely beaked head and unblinking golden eyes, the leather straps of a halter led back to a saddle strapped to the griffin's soldiers. In the saddle sat a helmeted figure clad in green and gold armor. An elven face with brown eyes and snow-colored hair peered out from underneath the bronze helmet. Spread out below them, elf and griffin, was the whole country of Sylvanesti. Where wind had driven the clouds away, the griffin rider could see the green carpet of forests and fields. To his right, the wandering silver ribbon of Thonthalus, the Lord's River, flowed around the verdant Fallon Island. On this island was Sylvanos, the city of a thousand white towers. "'Are you ready, Archibalus?' whispered the rider to his mount. He wound the leather reins tightly around his strong, slender hand. Now, he cried, drawing the reins sharply down. The griffin put his head down and folded its, folded its wings. Down they plummeted like a thunderbolt dropped from a clear sky. The young elf bent close to the griffin's neck, burying his fingers in the dense, copper-hued feathers. The massive muscles under his fingers were taut, waiting. Archibalus was well trained and loyal to its master. It would not open its wings again until two told to do so. If its master so desired, the griffin would plunge straight into the fertile soil of Sylvanesti. They were below the clouds, and the land leapt into clear view. The rich green canopy of trees was more obvious now. The griffin rider could see the pines and the mighty oaks reaching up, connecting soil to the sky. It was a view of the land few were ever granted. He had dropped many thousands of feet, and only a few hundred feet remained. The wind tore at his eyes, bringing tears. He bleaked them away. Archibalus flexed its folded wings nervously, and a low growl sounded in his throat. They were very low. The rider could see individual branches in the trees, see birds fleeing from the griffin's rapidly growing shadow. Now the rider hauled back sharply on, his, on the reins. The broad wings opened slowly. The beast's hindquarters dropped as its head rose. The rider felt himself slide backward, bumping against the rear lip of the tail saddle. 
The griffin soared up in a high arc, wings failing. He let the reins out, and the beast leveled off. He whispered a command, and the griffin held its wings out motionless. They started down again in a steep glide. The lower air was rough, full of eddies and currents, and the griffin bobbed and pitched. The rider threw back his head and laughed. They skimmed over the trees. Abruptly the woods gave way to orderly rows of trees, orchards of cherry, plum, and fema nuts. Elves working in the orchard saw only a large object hurtle above their heads, and they panicked. Many tumbled down ladders, spilling baskets of fruit. The rider put a brass horn to his lips, sounding a shrill note. The griffin added its own eerie call, a deep trilling growl that was also part lion, part eagle. The rider urged the beast up. The wings beat lazily, gaining a few dozen feet of height. They banked right, swooping over the slow-flowing waters of the Thonthalus. There were many watercraft plying the river flat, log rafts pulled by sturdy, sun-browned elves, piled high with pots and cloths to be traded in the south. The slender dugouts of the fishers, the bottoms of which were silvered with the morning's catch. The griffins swept over them in a flurry of wings. The rafters and fishers looked up idly from their work. As travelers up and down the great waterway, they were not easily impressed, not even by the sight of a royal griffin in flight. On they flew across the river to Fallon Island. The rider wove his flying steed among the many white towers so skillfully that the griffin never once scraped a wingtip. Their shadow chased them down the streets. The rider approached the center point of the city and the center point of every elf's life and loyalty, the Tower of the Stars. At six hundred feet it was the tallest spire in Sylvanost and the seat of power of the Speaker of the Stars. He steered the griffin in a quick circle around the white marble tower. The horn was at his lips again, and he blew a rude, flat warning. It was a lark, a bit of aerial fun, but halfway around the tower, the rider spied a lone figure on the high balcony, looking out over the city. He reined back and side-slipped Acrobalus toward the tower. The white-haired, white-robed figure was no one less than Sithil, Speaker of the Stars. Startled, the rider clumsily turned the griffin away. His eyes met those of the elven monarch for a moment, then Sithil turned and re-entered the tower. The griffin rider shook his head and made for home. He was in trouble. North of the tower, across the ornate gardens of Asterin, stood the palace of Quinari. Here the descendants of Sylvanos, the house royal, lived. The palace stood clear of the trees and consisted of three three-story wings radiating from a rose-colored marble tower. The tower soared 300 feet from base to pinnacle. The three wings of the palace were faced with beautiful colonnades of green streaked marble. The columns spiraled gracefully upward from their bases, each an imitation of a unicorn's horn. The rider's heart raced as the palace came into view. He had been away four days hunting, flying, and now he had an appointment to keep. He knew there would be trouble with the speaker for his indolent behavior at the Tower of the Stars, but for now, thoughts of upcoming rendezvous made him smile. He brought the griffin in with firm tugs on the reins. He steered toward the eastern wing of the palace. Lion's claws behind and eagle's talons in front touched down on the cool slate roof. With a tired shudder, Archibalus drew in its wings. Servants in seafless tunics and short kilts ran out to take the beast's bridle. Another elf set a wooden stepladder against the animal's side. The rider ignored it. He threw a leg over the griffin's neck and nimbly dropped to the rooftop. More servants rushed forward, one with a bowl of clean water, the other with a neatly folded linen towel. Highness, said the bull bearer, would you care to refresh yourself? A moment, the rider pried off his helmet and shook his sweat-damp hair. How goes everything here, he asked, dipping his hands and arms in the clean water once, twice, three times. The water quickly turned dingy with dirt. It goes well, my prince, the bull bearer replied. He snapped his head at his companion, and the second service servant preferred the towel. Any word from my brother, Prince Sithis? In fact, yes, his highness. Your brother was recalled yesterday by your father. He re returned from the temple of Mathery this morning. Puzzlement knit the rider's pale brows. Recalled? But why? I do not know, my prince. Even now, the speaker is closeted with Prince Sithis in the Tower of the Stars. The rider tossed the towel back to the servant and brought it. Send word, send word to my mother that I have returned. Tell her I shall see her presently. And should my father and brother return from the tower before sunset, tell them the same. 
the servants bowed. It shall be done, my prince. The elfin prince went briskly to the stairs that led from the rooftop into the palace. The servants hastened after him, sloshing dirty water from the bowl as they went. Prince Kithkanan, will you not take some food? called the bowl bearer. No. See to it Archibalus is fed, watered, and brushed down. Of course. And stop following me. The servants halted as if arrow shot. Prince Kithkanan rattled down the stone steps into the palace. As it was early summer, all the window shutters were open, flooding the interior corridors with light. He strode along, scarcely acknowledging the bows and greetings of the ser the bows and greetings of the servants and courtiers he met. The length of the shadows on the floor told him he was late. She would be angry, being kept waiting. Kithkanan breezed out the main entrance of the palace. Guards in burnished armor snapped to attention as he passed. His mood lightened with every step. He took toward the gardens of Astorin. So what if his father dressed him down later? It wouldn't be the first time, by any means. Any amount of lecturing was worth his hurried flight home to be on time for his rendezvous with Hermathia. The gardens bulked around the base of the great tower. Not long after Sylvanas, founder of the Elven Nation, had completed the Tower of the Stars, priest of the god Astoran asked for permission to create a garden around the structure. Sylvanas gladly granted their request. The clerics laid out the garden in the point plan of a four-pointed star, each point aligned with one of the cardinal directions. They wove spells granted to them by Astoran, the bard king, spells that formed the trees and flowers in wonderful ways. Fordless red and white roses grew in delicate spirals around the trunks of their evergreen oaks. Wisteria dripped purple blossoms into still, clear pools of water. Lilacs and carnelias drenched the air with their perfume. Broad leaves of ivy spread over the garden paths, shading them and protecting strollers from all but the harshest rains. And most remarkably, laurels and cedars grew in circular groves, their tops coming together to form perfect shelters where elves could meditate. Sylvanas himself had favored a grove of laurels on the west side of the garden. When the august founder of the elven nation had died, the leaves on the laurels there changed from green to gold, and they re remained that way ever after. Kithkanon did not enter the garden of Astaron by one of the paths. In his deerskin boots he crept silently beside the shoulder-high wall of spell-shaped mulberry. He hoisted himself over the wall and dropped down on the other side, still without a sound. Crouching low, he moved toward the grove. The prince could hear the impatient rustle of footsteps beside the golden grove. In his mind, he saw Hermathia pacing to and fro, arms folded, her red-gold hair like a flame in the center of the gilded trees. He slipped around to the entrance to the grove. Hermathia had her back to him, her arms folded tight with vexation. Kith Kanan called her name. Hermathia whirled. Kith, you startled me. Where have you been? Hurrying to you. Lied. Her angry expression lasted only a moment longer, and then she ran to him, him, her bright blue gown flying. They embraced in the arch entry of Sylvanas's retreat. The embrace became a kiss. After a moment, Kithkanon drew back a bit and whispered, We'd best be wary. My father's in the tower. He might see us. In answer, her mercy had pulled the prince's face down to hers and kissed him again. Finally, she said breathlessly, Now let us hide. They entered the shelter of the Laurel Grove. Under the elaborate rules of courtly manners, a prince and a well-born elf maiden could not consort freely, as Kith Kanon and Hermathia had for the past half year. Escorts had to accompany both of them if they ever saw each other at all. Protocol demanded that they not be alone together. I missed you terribly, Hermathia said, taking Kith Kanon's hand and leading him to the great granite bench. Sylvanos is like a tomb when you're not here. I'm sorry I was late. Archibalus had headwinds to fight all the way home. This was not strictly true, but why anger her further? Actually, Kithkanon had broken camp late because he had stayed to listen to two Kaganesti elves tell tall tales of adventures in the West, in the lands of the humans. Next time, Hermathia said, tracing the line of Kithkanon's jaw with one slender, slender finger, take me with you. On a hunting trip? She nipped at his ear. Her hair smelled of sunshine and spice. Why not? He hugged her close, burying his face in her hair and inhaling deeply. You could probably handle yourself right enough, but what the respectable maiden would travel in the forest with a male not her father, brother, or husband? I don't want to be respectable. 
Kithkin had studied her face. Her Matia had the dark blue eyes of Oak Leaf Clan and the high cheekbones of her mother's family, the Sunbury Clan. In her slender, beautiful face, he saw passion, wit, courage. Love, he murmured. Yes, her Matia replied. I love you too. The prince looked deep into her eyes and said softly, Marry me, her Matia. Her eyes widened and she pulled away from him, chuckling. What's funny, he demanded. Why talk of marriage? Giving me a star jewel will not make me love you more. I like the way things are. Kithkinon waved to the surrounding golden laurels. You like meeting in secret, whispering and flinching at every sound lest we be discovered? She leaned close again. Of course, that makes it all the more stimulating. He had to admit his life had been anything but boring lately. Kithkinon caressed his lover's cheek. Wind stirred to the gilded leaves as they drew closer. She entwined her fingers in his white hair. The prince thought no more of marriage as her mating had filled his senses. They parted with smiles and quiet touches on each other's faces. Her mating had disappeared down the garden path with a toss of bronze red hair and a swish of cleaning silk. Kithkanon stood in the entrance of the golden grove and watched her until she was lost from sight. Then, with a sigh, he made for the palace. The, hunt, the sun had set, and he, as he crossed the palace, the prince saw that the servants were setting lamps in the windows of the palace. All Sylvanos glimmered with light by night, but the palace of Quinari, with its massive tower and numerous tall windows, was like a constellation in the heavens. Kithkanon felt very satisfied as he jauntily ascended the steps by the main doors. The guards clacked their spears against their shoulder armor. The one on Kithkanon's right said, Highness, the speaker bids you go to the hall of Bailiff. Well, I'd best not keep the speaker waiting, he replied. The guard snapped too, and he passed on into the deep arch opening. Even the prospect of a tongue lashing by his father did little to lower Kithkanon's spirits. He still breathed a clean, spicy scent of Hermathia, and he still glazed into the bottomless blue depths of her eyes. The Hall of Bailiff, named for the Kinder General who had once fought so well on behalf of the great Sylvanos, took up an entire floor of the central tower. Kithkinok swung up the broad stone stairs, clapping servants on the back and halting quarter ears heartily. Smiles flowed in the elven prince's wake. Oddly, two guards stood outside the high bronze doors of the Hall of Bailiff. The doors were not usually guarded. As Kithkanon approached, one guard wrapped on the bronze panel behind him with the blood of his spear. Silently, Kithkanon stood by as the two soldiers pushed the heavy portals apart for him. The hall was indifferently lit by a rack of candles on the oval feasting table. The first face Kithkanon saw did not belong to his father, Sithil. Sithus! The tall, white-haired young elf stood up behind the table. Kithkanon circled the table and embraced his twin brother heartily. Though they lived in the same city, they saw each other only at intervals. Sithus spent most of his time in the Temple of Mathery, where the priests had been educating him since he was a child. Kithkanon was frequently away, flying, riding, and hunting. Ninety years they'd lived, and by the standards of their race, they were barely adults. Time and had a habit had altered the twins, so much so that they were no longer exact copies of each other. Sithus, elder by scant minutes, was slim and pale, the consequences of his scholarly life. His face was lit by large hazel eyes, the eyes of his father and grandma, grandfather. On his white robe he wore a narrow red stripe, a tribute to Mathery, whose color it was. Kithkanon, because of his outdoor life, had skin almost as brown as his eyes. The life of a ranger had toughened him, broadened his shoulders, and hardened his muscles. I'm in trouble, he said ruefully. What have you done this time, Sithis asked, loosening his grip on his twin. I was out flying on Archibalus. Have you been scaring the farmers again? No, it's not that. I was over the city, so I circled the Tower of the Stars. Blowing your horn, no doubt. Kithkin inside. Well, you let me finish. I went around the tower, very gently. But who should be there on the high balcony but Father? He saw me and gave me that look. Sithis folded his arms. I was there, too inside. He wasn't pleased. His twin lowered his voice to a conspiratorial whisper. What is this all about? He didn't call me here to chastise me, did he? He wouldn't be here for that. No, father called me back from the temple before you came home. He's gone upstairs to fetch mother. 
He's got something to tell you. Kith Kanan relaxed, realizing he wasn't going to get dressed down. What is it, Sith? I'm getting married, said Sithis. Kith Kanan, wide-eyed, leaned back on the table. By Eli, is that all you have to say? I'm getting married? Sithis shrugged. What else is there to say? Father decided that it's time. So married I get. Kith Kanan grinned. Has he picked a girl? I think that's why he sent for you and mother. We all will find out at the same time. You mean, you don't know who it is yet? No, there are fourteen suitable clans within House Cleric, so there are many prospective brides. Father has chosen one based on the dowry offered and according to which family he wants to link with House Royal. His brother's eyes danced with merriment. She will probably be ugly and a shrew as well. That doesn't matter. All that matters is that she be healthy, well-born, and properly worship the gods, Sith said calmly. I don't know. I think wit and beauty ought to count for something, Kiskanan replied. And love. What about love, Sith? How do you feel about marrying a stranger? It is the way things are done. That was so like him. The quickest way to ensure Sith's cooperation was to invoke tradition. Kiskanan clucked his tongue and walked in a slow circle around his motionless twin. His words rang off the polished stone walls. But is it fair, he said, mildly mocking. I mean, any scribe or smith in the city can choose his mate himself, because her, he loves her and she loves him. The wild elves of the woods, the green sea elves, do they marry for duty? Or do they take a mate as a loving companion who will bear them children and be a strength to them in their ancient age? I'm not any smith or scribe, much less a wild elf, Sith said. He spoke quietly. But his words carried as clearly as Kith Kanan's loud pronouncements. I am first born of the Speaker of the Stars, and my duty is my duty. Kith Kanan stopped circling and slumped against the table. It's the old story, isn't it? Why Sithis and rash Kith Kanan, he said. Don't pay me any heed. I'm really glad for you, and I'm glad for me too. At least I can choose my own wife when the time comes. Sithis smiles. Do you have someone in mind? Why not tell Sithis, he thought. His twin would never give him away. Actually, Kith Kanan began, there is. The rear door of the hall opened, and Sithel entered, with Nerakina at his side. Hail, father, the brothers said in unison. The speaker waved for his son to sit. He held a chair out for his wife, then sat himself. The crown of Sylvanesti, a circle of gold and silver stars, weighed heavily on his brow. He had come to the time in his life when age was beginning to show. Sithel's hair had always been white, but now its silky blondness had become brittle and gray. Tiny lines were retched around his eyes and mouth and his hazel eyes. The sign of the hair of the Sylvanos betrayed the slightest hint of cloudiness. All these were small outward signs of the great burden of time Sithel carried in his lean, erect body. He was 1,500 years old. Though past a thousand herself, Lady Nerakina was still life and graceful. She was small by Elven standards, almost doll-like. Her hair was honey brown, as were her eyes. They were traits of her clan, Clan Silvermoon. A sense of gentleness radiated from her, a gentleness that soothed her often irritable husband. It was said about the palace that Sithis had his father's looks and his mother's temperament. Kit Kanin had inherited his mother's eyes and his father's energy. You look well, dear Kina, said to Kith Kanan. Was your trip rewarding? Yes, lady, I do love to fly, he said, after kissing her cheek. Sithel gave his son a sharp glance. Kith Kanan cleared his throat and bid his father a polite greeting. I'm glad you returned when you did, Sithel said. Has Sithis told you of his upcoming marriage? Kith Kanan admitted he had. You will have an important part to play as well, Kith. As the brother of the groom, it will be your job to escort the bride to the Tower of the Stars. Yes, I will, but tell us who it is, insisted the impatient prince. She is a maiden of exceptional spirit and beauty, I'm told, Sithel said. Well educated, well born. Father, Kith Kinnam pleaded. Sithis himself sat quietly, hands folded on his lap. Years of training in the temple of Mathery had given him formidable patience. My son, Sithel said to Sithis, your wife's name is Hermathia, daughter of Lord Shinbaris of the Oathcleave clan. Sithis raised an eyebrow approvingly. Even he had noticed Hermathia. He had said nothing, but nodded his acceptance. Are you 
you all right, Kith? Narakina asked. You look quite pale. To her surprise, Kith Kanan looked as if his father had struck him across the face. The prince swallowed hard and nodded, unable to speak. Of all the eligible daughters, Hermathia was to marry Sithis. It was incomprehensible. It could not happen. None of his family knew of his love for her. If they knew, if his father knew, he'd choose someone else. Ah, Kith Kanan managed to say, who, who else knows of this? Only the bride's family, said Sithil. I sent Shambaris acceptance of the dowry this morning. A sinking feeling gripped Kith Kanan. He felt like he was melting into the floor. Hermatia's family already knew? There was no going back now. The speaker had given his word. He could not, in honor, rescind his decision without gravely offending Clan Oakleaf. His parents and brother began to discuss details of the wedding. A tremor passed through Kith Kanan. He resolved to stand up and declare his love for Hermathia, declare that she was his and no one else's. Sithis was his brother, his twin, but he didn't know her. He didn't love her. He could find another wife. Kith Kanan could not find another love. He rose unsteadily to his feet. I, he began, all eyes turned to him. Think, for once in your life, he admonished himself. What will they say to you? What, said father, are you ill, boy? You don't look well. I don't feel too well, Kith Kanan said hoarsely. He wanted to shout, to run, to smash and break things. But the massive calm of his mother, father, and brother held him down like a thick blanket. He cleared his throat and added, I think that all that flying has caught up with me. Nirkina stood and put a hand to his face. You do feel warm. Perhaps you should rest. Yes, yes, he said. That's just what I need. Rest. He held the table edge for support. I make the formal announcement when the white moon rises tonight. The priests and nobles will gather in the tower, Sithil said. You must be there, Kith. I, I'll be there, Father, Kith Kanan said. I just need to rest. Sithis walked with his brother to the door. Before they went out, Sithil remarked, Oh, and leave your horn at the palace, Kith. One act of impudence a day is enough. The speaker smiled, and Kith Kanan managed a weak grin in reply. Shall I send a healer to you? asked Nirkana. No, I'll be fine, Mother, Kith Kanan said. In the corner outside, Sithis braced his brother's shoulders and said, Looks as if I'm to be lucky, both brains and beauty in my wife. You are lucky, Kith Kanan said. Sithis looked at him in concern. Kith Kanan was moved to say, Whatever happens, Sith, don't think, don't think too badly of me. Sithis frowned. What do you mean? Kith Kanan inhaled deeply and turned to climb up the stairs to his room. Just remember that nothing will ever separate us. We are two halves of the same coin. Two branches of the same tree, Sithis said, completing the ritual the twins had invented as children. His concern deepened as he watched Kith Kanan climb slowly up the stairs. Kith Kanan didn't let his brother see his face contort with pain. He only had a scant two hours before Solinari, the white moon, rose above the trees. Whatever he was going to do, he had to think of it before then. The great and noble of Sylvanesti filed at the open hall of the Tower of the Stars. Rumors flew through the air like sparrows between courtier and cleric, noble clan father and humble acolyte. Such assemblances in the tower were rare and usually involved a matter of state. A pair of young heralds draped in bright green tabards and wearing circlets of oak and laurel marched into the hall in perfect step. They turned and stood on each side of the great door. Slender trumpets went to their lips and a stirring fanfare blared forth. When the horn ceased, a third herald entered. Free elves and true, give heed to his highness, Sithil, speaker of the stars. Everyone bowed silently as Sithil appeared and walked to his own emerald throne. There was a spontaneous cry of, All hail the speaker, from the ranks of the nobles. The hail rang with elven voices. The speaker mounted the steps, turned and faced the assembly. He sat down and the hails died. The herald spoke again, Sithis, son of Sithil, Sithil, prince heir. Sithis passed through the doorway bowed to his father and approached the throne. As his son mounted the seven steps to the platform, Sithil held out his hand, indicating his son should stand to the left of the throne. Sithis took his place, facing the audience. The trumpet blared again. Lady Narakina, wife, 
and Prince Kithkinan, son of Sithal. Kithkinan entered with his mother on his arm. He had changed to his courtly robes of sky-blue linen, clothing he rarely wore. He moved stiffly down the center aisle, his mother's hand resting lightly on his left arm. Smile, she whispered. I don't know four-fifths of them, Kithkinan muttered. Smile anyway, they know you. When he reached the steps, the pommel of Kithkinan's sword poked out from under his ceremonial sash. Nirkina glanced down at the weapon, which was largely, largely concealed by the luminous folds of his robe. Why did you bring that? she whispered. It's part of my costume, he replied. I have a right to wear it. Don't be impertinent, his mother said primly. You all know that this is a peaceful occasion. A large wooden chair, cushioned with red velvet, was set in place for the speaker's wife on the left of Prince of this. Kith Kinnan, like his son, was expected to stand in the presence of, his, presence of his father, the monarch. Once the royal family was in place, the simple nobles lined up to pay their respects to the speaker. The time-honored ritual called for priests first, the clan fathers of House Cleric next, and the masters of the city guilds last. Kith Kinnan, far to the left of Sithel, searched for Hermathia in the press of people. The crowd numbered some three hundred, and though they were quiet, the shuffling of feet and rustling of silk and linen filled the tower. The heralds advanced to the foot of the speaker's throne and announced each group as they formed up before Sithel. The priests and priestesses in their white robes and golden headbands each wore a sash in the color of their patron deity. Silver for Eli, red for Mathery, brown for Jerjoleth, sky blue for Quinesti Pa, and so on. By ancient law, they were barefoot as well, so they would be closer to the sacred soil of Sylvanesti. The clan fathers shepherded their families past the speaker. Keth Kinnan caught his breath as Lord Shinbaris of Clan Oakleaf reached the head of the line. He was a widower, so his eldest daughter stood behind, beside him, Hermathia. Sithel spoke for the first time since entering the Tower of the Stars. Lady, he said to Hermathia, will you remain? Hermathia, clad in emboldened, embroidered gown the color of, of summer sunlight, her striking face framed by two maidenly braids, which Kith Kinnan knew she hated, bowed to the speaker and stood aside from her family at the foot of the throne platform. The hiss of three hundred whispering tongues filled the hall. Sithel stood and offered a hand to him, Hermathia. She went up the stair without hesitation and stood beside him. Sithel nodded to the herald. A single note split the air. Silence in the hall. His Highness will speak, cried the herald. A hush descended. Sithel surveyed the crowd, ending his suite by looking at his wife and sons. Holy clerics, elders, subjects, be at ease in your hearts, he said, his rich voice echoing in the vast open tower. I have called you here to receive joyous news. My son, Sithis, who shall be speaker after me, has reached the age and inclination to take a wife. After due consultation with the gods and with the chiefs of all the clans of House Cleric, I have found a maiden suitable to be my son's bride. Kith Kinnan's left hand strayed to his sword hilt. A calm had descended over him. He had thought long and hard about this. He knew what he had to do. I have chosen this mate knowing full well the disappointment that will arise in other clans, Sithel was saying. I deeply regret it. If this were a barbarian land where husbands may have more than one life, I dare say I could make more of you happy. Polite laughter rippled through the ranks of the nobles. But the speaker may have only one wife, so one is all I have chosen. It is my great hope that she and my son will be as happy together as I have been with my Nerakina. He looked at Sithis, who advanced to his father's side. Holding Hermetia's left hand, the speaker reached for Sithil's right. The crown held its breath, waiting, him, waiting for him to make the official announcement. Stop! The couple's fingers were only a hair's breadth apart when Kith Kinnan's voice rang out. Sithil turned in surprise to his younger son. Every eye in the hall looked with shock at the prince. Hermetia cannot marry, Sithis, Kith Kinnan declared. Be silent, Sithel said harshly. Have you gone mad? No, father, Kith Kinnan said calmly. Hermathia loves me. Sithis drew his hand from his father's slack fingers. In his hand he held a star jewel, the traditional betrothal gift among elves. Sithis knew something had been brewing. 
Kitkanan had been too obviously troubled by the announcement of his bride-to-be, but he had not guessed at the reason. What does this mean? demanded Lord Charburus, moving to his daughter's side. Kitkanan advanced to the edge of the raised floor. Tell him, Hermatia. Tell them all. Sithis looked at his father. Sithis' gaze was on Sithil's gaze was on Hermatia. Her cheeks were faintly pink, but her expression was calm. Her eyes cast down. When Hermatia said nothing, Sithil commanded, "Speak, girl. Speak the truth." Hermatia lifted her gaze and looked directly at Sithis. "I want to marry the speaker's heir," she said. Her voice was not loud, but in the tense silence, every sound, every word was like a thunderclap. "No!" Kethkanan exclaimed. "What was she saying? Don't be afraid, Thaya. Don't let your father sway you. Tell them the truth. Tell them who you love." Still, Hermatia's eyes were on Sithis. I choose the speaker's heir. Thaya! Kitkanon would have rushed to her, but Nerkina interposed herself, pleading with her son to be still. He gently but firmly pushed her aside. Only Sithis between Tud stood between him and Hermatia now. Stand aside, brother, he said. Be silent, his father roared. You dishonor us all. Kitkanon drew his sword. Gasps and shrieks filled the Tower of the Stars. Bearing a weapon in the hall was a serious offense, a sacrilegious act. But Kid Kanan wavered. He looked at the sword in his hand, at his brother's and father's faces, and at the woman he loved. Hermatia stood unset. Rate, comment, and subscribe. Thank you.